Hello and welcome back to GoldStopTrades.com. Today we have a new and special guest with us, Dev Randhawa. Dev is founder and CEO of Fission Uranium. Fission Uranium can be traded as FCU on the Toronto Stock Exchange, and he's also CEO of Fission 3.0, which can be traded as FUU on the TSX Venture. Thanks, Dev, for being here with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Dev, you have one of the most significant discoveries, uranium discoveries, uh, in the in the past few decades. Talk to us about the significance of, of finding uh, this new high-grade discovery in the Athabasca Basin. Well, uranium is um, it's found all over the world, but it certainly is... Um, the grades really vary. And obviously, you know, politics really vary, but grades vary even more. Um, the grades in Namibia, Niger, Australia, they might run anywhere from 0.05 to 0.2%. Where in the Athabasca, they run 1.5 to 2%. So they are anywhere from 10 to 20 times higher than the rest of the world. Um, so the Athabasca is a very small part of the middle of the country. And the thing is, though, they're very hard to find because they're not close to surface often. Most of the big deposits of Gar Lake and MacArthur are deeper, anywhere from 200, 400 to 600 meters down. So they're hard to find. But when you do, they're very, very um, rich. Um, each, you know, they're, at the end of the day, you're digging the holes, whatever you're doing, it's how much each, you know, a ton of rock is worth. And so uranium, by definition, because it's so high grade in the Athabasca, it's, you know, it's, it, the ore bodies there aren't just the richest uranium ore bodies, the richest ore bodies, period. For example, in the Athabasca, the grades run 40 to 50, the equivalent of 40 to 50 grams a ton of gold. When you keep in mind the richest deposits are 2 to 3 or 8 grams per ton, these are very high-grade ore bodies. So to find something there is very challenging um, and, and rewarding, but to find something so close to the surface, like our technical team has done, um, make kicks off that last box. You know, people are looking to put something into production. They want something high grade, open pitable, in a great jurisdiction, and the rock be something you can dig out of, like basement rock. So, this project ticks all those boxes: high grade, open pitable, in a, in a great jurisdiction like Saskatchewan, and the last thing in basement rock. So, it ticks all the big boxes that you want to have. The big companies want if they're going to buy something because. When times are tough, it's it's the high, these kind of deposits get mined first. It's the ones that are marginal that don't get mined first, and so that's why this is a very significant project, project not just uh, uranium wise but uh, ore body wise. And Dev, it's it's significant because it's come during this post Fukushima period. Could you talk to us? I know you traveled to Asia. Talk to us about the supply demand fundamentals and the importance of finding this discovery and possibly uh, the next upturn in the uranium cycle? Well, I've been doing this since it was $7 a pound. I believe um, at the end of the day, investors care about making money. And so I was told long ago, you're a contrarian or you're a victim by Rick Rule. So I've always gone into areas where the grades made sense, the numbers made sense, but the sentiment wasn't there. Unfortunately, stock markets are run by fear and greed, and that's why I never a stock is never, you know, properly valued. It's always oversold or overbought. That's just the way stocks are. So I started uranium a long time ago, and when it was seven dollars a pound, so there was even worse times. Even then, you know, I try to tell people that, hey, you know, you can't continue to, you can't continue to use something more than it's being produced for so long. The, the inventories will run out, and then you have to. Then the economics have to change. So uranium went from seven dollars all the way to one hundred and forty dollars, and it's because greed kicked in. Prior to that was fear. Now we're back to a fear stage again, I believe, where people are so fearful they can't put any valuations on something that's very rich, like the PLS deposit. Now people are forgetting there's more reactors being built today than before Fukushima. 
there are, and what's really been happening is the so-called buying cycle of utilities um, have been broken. They used to buy anywhere from 100 to 110 million pounds a year, and they get the balance from um, Russia's from their megawatt, the, the megatons, the megawatts program that they had, which is about 20 million pounds, and other from uh, other sources, uh, secondary sources like um, inventories. So we instead of getting 100, 110 million pounds, you know, being bought by utilities, they only bought like 30, 40, 50 million. Utilities have not been buying because they've been waiting for Japan to turn around. And Japan, after Fukushima, decided to obviously wisely shut down all the reactors and make sure they're all safe. And so, and that has gone a little slower than obviously people expected, but they are supposed to have two more going, two on this year, four more possibly. But the bottom line is, that they are turning them back on. Japan has no choice but to use nuclear energy. It's not like they have hydro or gas or oil. They have to use liquefied LNG, and therefore they, they pay heavily for that. Their, their cost is three times what America pays. So they don't have that choice. Oh, I think we'll just go LNG or et cetera. So Japan will have to. They want to be competitive because they're an export-based economy. They have to go back to uh, nuclear power. Um, so... But the bigger elephant in the room is what China is doing. They've announced recently they're going to build 100 reactors. They've got 23 now. They want to go to 29 by the end of the year. We're talking one reactor every two months. Whereas, you know, we make big news about it when, you know, Germany wants to shut down two or four reactors. Big deal. Unfortunately, investors should not pay attention to the front page of newspapers but the back pages. Um, so this is what you're seeing is that, Lots of reactors will be built by China. I was just over there and meeting with um, the number one nuclear group there called CGN, and they have announced that they're going to build 100 more reactors. They need them. Um, they want to have their nuclear up to about 15% of the energy mix. They're at one and a half now, and that means having you know another 150 reactors. So they want to build 100. They raised three and a half billion dollars in their IPO. And they've also indicated their next acquisition will be in the Athabasca. So China is going to grow, and I think they're going to come to Canada for some of their um, next source of uranium. Um, so despite what you're seeing, the, the market is live and well. And I'm not saying it's going to be $140 a pound again, but I do believe I can see uranium going back up to 60 to $80. Because that's really the average cost of building a, a building uranium mine in the world. Um, you can have cash costs of, let's say, 30, 40, but really you never get your money back out of your CapEx if you don't get the prices of 60 to $80. So I, I see uranium prices going up because they have to. And China is not going to stop building reactors. If you, I just I just came back from there, and I can tell you how disgusting the pollution really is. You, know, you could, it's like going to a bad, you know, Batman movie when it's got this, you know, if you've been to London when it's very foggy or you've been, San Diego or San Francisco, well, imagine the same scene except it's pollution. You literally cannot see buildings not that far from you because of the pollution. And uh, the pollution is actually inside the Beijing airport. So they they know they have to do something, and they are. And um, we're excited for them because they'll be coming to hopefully Athabasca to get their next source of uranium. Yeah, they need uranium for the the clean energy, and uh, that you guys have delineated over 110 million pounds of uranium. Dev, could you highlight the management team, your track record of success uh, over the past few years? Well, you know, to be an exploration, you've got to be well funded. You've also got to have people who spend money wisely, and I like to think that we have a good balance of raising money at the right times. And the way to raise money is when you can, not when you have to. So you have to think ahead always. And secondly, you've got to have a great technical team. And that's what I think we have, led by Ross McElroy and Ray Ashley. Ross has been involved, and in, there's only been four major discoveries. That's over, like, even to me, it's over 10 million pounds uh, plus. Um, and that would be uh, the half is one, the Phoenix, then you've got the J-Zone, which we and Ross had now of the PLS. And so at the end of the day, you know, it's the question that investors should always ask is, are management interests aligned with those of shareholders? Meaning are they getting most of the compensation from their salary or are they put their money in their own deals? You know, are they 
eating their own cooking. And so that's one thing about us. As you'll see, we've been, we've been buyers of stock all these years. Some of my stock I own since 1996. So, you know, for us, um, it's about making sure shareholders win um, and uh, making sure that we make decisions in the best interest of shareholders. Not the best way we do that is to make sure we're shareholders. So I think those are the crucial pieces. Um, you know, Ross is, outside of this, Ross has been involved and other discoveries in the basin, two more. Um, I've been involved in coal bed methane overseas in China. I've been able to go over there, find assets, develop them, and sell them back to the Chinese. So, you know, deal making is part of our DNA as a group, making good discoveries. Um, you, you know, beating the big boys is um, in their own backyard, you know, something which Ross and the guys have done very well. But it's because we're well funded and we have a great set of shareholders over the years. Who put can you, can you believe that will add value for them as shareholders? Dev, we know the PLS discovery uh, is getting bigger uh, and it's world class. As we can conclude here, can you talk to us about the spin out Fission 3.0? Uh, yeah. Fission Uranium recently made an uh, a, a investment uh, in the company. Right. And I was wondering if you could comment about your future growth with Fission 3.0. Absolutely. Um, our choice was not to split the company in two, but because of the transaction, the alpha turned out that what well, we did. But Fission 3.0 is a private generator model where we will we go out and we use our technology to find land that has been underlooked uh, by others. And the way we did that is we have an airplane that's like a flying scintillometer that can detect boulders of uranium or outcrops of uranium. And so we, find, we feel we can get something close to the surface that it might come from a, a shallow source as well. So that's really where you know, we're at right now um, is that we're trying to um, repeat what's happened in PLS. And the way we did that was we found boulders, outcrops, follow them up the ice, and you make your discovery. So we're um, um, we're, we're trying to repeat it uh, by using the same sign, the same model, and if the difference is we're trying to bring in partners, we've got about 16 projects in that company. So we have a patented technology, the same management team, the same technical people who have found the J Zone, the PLS, um, and we're bringing in other smart pe other people's money um, that we can um, have. Um, you know, because that's expensive. We don't, we can't, otherwise we'll always be raising money diluting ourselves. It's better to bring other people in, get a drill ready, and go from there. So that's kind of our, um, our model is to, you know, use our, use our brains and buy properties cheaply and other people come in and help us drill. And it, and it works quite well because, you know, these companies like Braids and, um, um, and Asincourt and Aldrin that have joined venturing with us. You know, those are stocks that can go from, you know, $0.10 cents to $3. Um, so it's in their interest. Plus, you know, all they have to do is raise money. They don't have to do any, you know, all they got to do is watch over prices. But, you know, this group, we've dealt with Sumitomo of Japan, a previous company. Um, we've dealt with Korean electric power company. Um, you know, we've been very fortunate to... Um, be able to attract very large multi-billion dollar companies to come in and they hold you pretty accountable I can tell you that they are so we're used to being washed over every penny we're used to spending money wisely so I believe that 3.0 is a must have in your uranium portfolio and because um, if it hits it'll go from 10 cents to 50 cents you know and uh, a major discovery becomes a huge asset very quickly so in our mind um you know, we one day we will sell fission uranium, and our focus will be entirely on fission 3.0. And um, but again, we've got a very good president of the company named Philip Morehouse. He's an MBA, um, very uh, thorough individual. And um, again, I think it's a must-have in your uranium portfolio. Dev Randhawa, founder CEO of Fission Uranium, which can be traded as FCU on the Toronto Stock Exchange and Fission 3.0, which can be traded as FUU on the TSX Venture. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for taking the time.